sometimes when we shout, are you ready to rock? I don't care if you're ready to rock. <laughs> wow, that's heartbreaking. He doesn't care whether we're ready to rock or not. Well, the wrestling life. I am the Irish man raised in the hills of Ireland. I am the Irish man. Hey, everybody, it's the wrestling I life. It's episode 296. It is the third week of March of 2022. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and the only wrestling podcast. Obviously, the big news of the week, Scott Hall passed away uh, kind of unexpectedly. I mean, I guess the news came out last week that he fell and, and broke his hip. And was in the hospital uh, having his hip replaced. And then, unfortunately, in recovery from surgery, he had some complications. He had some heart attacks. And he ended up passing away on Monday this week. I think his death was announced first on live television, like if it was the Kennedy assassination or something. And I don't mean to make light of it, but that's what happened. Scott Hall, 63 years old, one of the biggest stars of the post National expansion, national expansion, 1984 era of wrestling. Um, guy with a complicated legacy, guy with complicated life. Thoughts on the passing of Scott Hall? Yeah, I think um, this is one of those things where, and we've talked about this quite a few times before, but it can be hard to talk about someone like Scott Hall because we have a certain inclination. We don't want to praise someone if we think they may have also done some really, or know as a matter of public record in some cases with Scott Hall, that they did some, some pretty bad and and reprehensible things. Cause we don't, you know, we like to heap praise or, or talk about how talented this person was. We like to think that talent is, is a meritocracy and that only good people reach, you know, good and, you know, upstanding perfect people get get to be big and famous and successful and and are talented and that's obviously that's obviously not the case in in the world and uh so yeah it's it's hard to to talk about scott hall without thinking about his his darker days obviously there's a lot of in especially in his last his post ddp yoga era there's a lot more positive stories about scott hall and you know being a kind sort of veteran voice that could you could bring in for seminars and whether that's WWE bringing him in to you know guest coach at NXT or or different indies I know um the guy who owns AIW was talking about how you know how helpful Scott Hall was and and how respectful he was and all that so I think it it a lot of this a lot of your feelings on Scott Hall if you knew him personally will probably be uh it'll probably be depend on when you knew him. Um, But for the rest of us, we mostly knew the television character. Obviously his, his uh, issues with sobriety and addiction are not, not any, in any way a secret. So we, but for those of us who mostly knew him as an on-screen character, he's one of, one of the biggest pieces of the most popular era of wrestling that's ever existed. And so, it's yes, it's a it's a complicated legacy, as you said. But you know, as an on-screen performer, he you know he was always a you know a tremendous worker. And I, I saw a lot of people phrase this in a different way over the last few days. But he was just one of those guys, and it's one of those things that you can't force it. But he made wrestling cool, and he was a very cool character on on television, even in those. You know, if you look at the the era of WWF that he started in as Razor Ramon, it's such a cartoon. Um, you know, they're competing with Disney in those days, as they say. And he's he could have very easily that Razor Ramon character could have easily just been one of the 55 different silly characters in that era. But because Scott Hall was playing that character, it worked. So, yeah, it's hard to you know, I don't want to. 
whitewash his his history or pretend that he was a, a perfect person but again you also you can you can acknowledge those those skeletons in the closet and i think still acknowledge that he's you know one of the more captivating performers of his era the thing that stands out if you go back and watch a lot of scott hall matches is that uh he was he was technically very good for a very big man <laughs> yeah absolutely i i mean i think a lot of people and that's actually something i was thinking about this week i know a fair amount of wwf matches that people point to i guess he was more of a tag guy and more of a character in in wcw and maybe the the work rate isn't isn't thought of as much when he gets there but i mean yeah I, that and that's another part too you mentioned for a big guy i think because he spent so much of his career standing next to kevin nash you don't think of scott hall as a big man but he was a very large man, and as you said, very, very good and technically sound for his size. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of great work rate WCW like post 1993. <laughs> period. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not from the main event guys anyway. That's true. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, more bad news in wrestling this week. Biggie broke his neck uh, taking a suplex on the floor from madcap moss not to blame moss rich holland uh rich holland that's right i don't want oh i'm sorry (laughs) i knew it was one of the young green guys (laughs) who who are probably like 37 but uh uh, yeah he took a, a suplex from rich holland on the floor it broke his neck and he's up walking around and stuff and he's in a collar um Apparently, it was a kind of break that did not need surgery. It's also uncertain. Like, I think with medical advancements and things like that, I think the chances that he comes back from this are probably pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a slam dunk that Big E ever wrestles again. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, like I said, I I think it's better than 60% that he does. But weird terrible freak injury and it was a green guy who is smaller than him suplexing him on the floor that um that caused this and taz pointed out problems with the technique of the suplex on twitter and taz's gimmick was in fact the human suplex machine so i trust his word on it just Mm -hmm. a bad freak thing but uh maybe preventable we don't want to i'm not trying to point fingers to anyone but it's not ballet things happen but just like really senseless and needless but i guess if there is a silver lining here it's that uh, biggie apparently is the most beloved human being in wrestling <laughs> that yeah that's almost indisputable i think after the just the outpouring from every almost every Every wrestler in every company uh, sent him well wishes over over that weekend. So, which was was really quite heartwarming to see. And you know, he sent out a couple of different videos, and you could tell he was very uh, very moved by that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's you can look at it as, hey, it's a big dude throwing another big dude on the floor in a random TV match. So you can that's like strike one, strike two, the one big dude you know, as you said, his technique was perhaps not perfect. He didn't rotate enough to allow Big E to flip over on the suplex. And then you have, so that's, that's, you know, strike two. And then, yeah, as you said, there's this, the part of, Hey, a freak thing happened. And, you know, if, if maybe it's, you know, they, they were, their timing was just a little bit off. And if he had thrown him another, you know, if they had been a little bit, slower with it or a little quicker with it maybe maybe he just flips over and and doesn't have doesn't think twice about it but yeah it was it was really gruesome when it happened and uh obviously got everyone was very concerned when he was rolled out on a stretcher immediately afterwards and yeah the fact that he is apparently not going to need surgery is really quite impressive and then he has all you know all movement and his his fingers and toes and obviously he put up a video uh the day we're recording this of him walking around in in his uh in his florida neighborhood so he's he's you know 
as good news as you can have while being told that your neck is broken, I guess, is what Big E got this week. But yeah, it was just, it was an awful thing. But if you look at the silver linings, it's that he won't need surgery and that, uh, you know, there's no, no, no doubt was left about just how uh, beloved and respected he is in professional wrestling. WWE has continued a somewhat lackluster build to WrestleMania. And maybe the biggest news is uh, in in that build to WrestleMania this week is that Seth Rollins is going to wrestle Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania, apparently. And yet here we are, you know, two weeks and some change away from from the shows. And Cody Rhodes still has not shown up on WWE television yet. (laughs) It's. It's something else. I just wish someone would say, hey, man, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> instead of great. instead of just like pretending that we know what's going on with Cody, could we just throw up our hands and say, look, I don't know. Maybe he's playing games. Maybe WWE's playing games. We don't know. Anyway, we expected Cody and Jacksonville this past week for Raw. That would be a bit of, oh, sweet irony. And yet <laughs> here we, we have... Um, Raw coming up this week in Chicago at the Allstate Arena would be a nice place to debut him there too. And he should beat up a character dressed as Kenny from South Park and beat up the Milwaukee (laughs) Bucks mascot and beat up Robert Stone on TV this week. Perhaps, perhaps behead a stuffed Jaguar. Like there's a lot of things that I would do with Cody that I don't think WWE is going to do with Cody, but anyway, Cody has not showed up yet. Yeah, I guess my thought is based on the fact that we're two weeks out and they haven't sniffed of anything else for Seth to do. You're like, well, it has to be him then. Because they wouldn't, you would think by now, if they didn't know he was coming in, they would have triggered like some sort of backup plan. Like remember that year where they weren't sure if Roman was going to make WrestleMania because of the, the alleged steroid scandal that turned out to be nothing. Um, and so they like didn't put Braun in a program until like a week before WrestleMania because they were like, just in case we have to suspend him or something, we're going to, we're going to leave Braun out in case he has to wrestle Brock. Yeah, that's right. He was the backup guy. Yeah. Yeah. But I like, I don't look around and see anybody like else being held out just in case they need a guy for Seth to wrestle. Um, I mean, I guess you could throw him into like the U.S. title match or something, at, you know, if at the last minute if you had to, but or have him do something in the Owens and and Austin thing. But it did not feel to me like they were they've been hedging their bets the way they usually do if they're not sure if something's gonna work out or not. So I would still assume he's coming in, but yeah, everyone and their mother thought well if you're gonna debut him and you haven't yet as of monday in jacksonville well this would be the time and when seth rollins did a promo talking about how he didn't have a road to wrestlemania and the whole crowd started chanting for cody and wwe didn't like mute it or (laughs) turn the crowd volume down i was like well this seems like again just seems like they wouldn't be doing all of this (laughs) if he wasn't there, but maybe they think they're like really doing some galaxy brain stuff where like Seth Rollins, they're going to do like the John Cena undertaker thing where Seth Rollins is going to be like in the crowd at WrestleMania. And then Cody will come out and they'll have a, an impromptu match or something. And it'll be, it'll be for some reason thought of as genius. I I suppose there was, there was a lot of credible intelligence this week that Cody was going to be on raw. And I told you this during the day and Mm -hmm. you're like, all right, well, well, hot dog. I'm going to watch raw. (laughs) You know how often I watch raw live all three hours of raw live. I'm going to say never. It's I couldn't tell you the last time that I had, I had watched all three hours of raw live and it wasn't even a bad show, but when you can't fast forward through video packages and stuff, you really feel those three hours, man. (laughs) Yeah, I gotta watch. I gotta watch. I gotta watch every week. <laughs> every single week, I watch it live. <laughs> so there's that. No thanks. 
That's that's more than fair. I tell you what, though, if I have to see the footage from that Madison Square Garden house show one more time, I'm going to snap. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, especially like, if it was like really some, I guess, Brock bled. Like, that's the only thing of note in it. But just the angle itself, like, I mean, it's fine. And I get why you wanted to play it like the week after it happened. But we're like, it's been like two weeks and they're still playing it on every show. All because Dave Meltzer would not shut up about how badly <laughs> WWE was doing at Madison Square Garden. The like, evil Dave Meltzer was bullying <laughs> poor WWE about their poor house show numbers. So they had no choice but to shoot an angle with Brock and Roman on it. At some point in the last week, Dave realized what I realized from the beginning. And he wrote that actually the problem is that WWE has run the New York market 14 times since July. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's the problem. <laughs> it's it's nothing inherently like it's not a super hot product, but it's not like all time low interest in the product. It's the fact that no matter how many times you run <laughs> a market, it's it, you're going to get diminishing returns if you run it 14 times in eight months or whatever. Jeez. Sure. <laughs> can't st- can't can't believe that it took him. 56 weeks to figure this out, but here we are. Uh, Roxy signed with WWE. Uh, people are extremely, I don't always trust their intentions <laughs> when it comes to Roxy. Uh-huh. Roxy is a very uh, handsome and very young lady who is very talented and was trained by Booker T and was Ring of Honor Women's World Champion. And now she's uh, signed with WWE and is going to NXT. So I don't trust how excited everyone is about her. I don't trust (laughs) their intentions, but uh, she's good. And I think she'll do well there. So that's that's a nice story. Yeah, I mean, she comes in at a good time because no one they don't have any good wrestlers in NXT anymore. (laughs) Except for Io Shirai, I guess, is still hanging around. And Kaylee Ray, maybe. But you need you need somebody that already knows how to work. I mean, she has to learn how to WWE work now, which means uh, jumping jacks and burpees, I guess. But uh, she's competent in the ring already, which is good. And the best news is, say, if, you're, if you don't watch a lot of WWE and you're bummed out, maybe you like Roxy in, in Ring of Honor, and you wanted to see her continue on or, or go elsewhere. Uh, she's very young, as you pointed out. So if, like many people uh, that WWE has signed over the past decade, she could spin her wheels. They could waste her time, your time, my time, everyone's time for like five years with her and then cut her. She's still super young. <laughs> and she gets to put, you know, former WWE superstar next to her name. So feels like a win-win. Hopefully she has a success and that's what she wants. And she's a big star and, and all that. But if not, she's still real young and she'll, you know, she can come back onto the indies in her mid twenties and be a bigger star than she was when she left and, and still have good matches and whatever else when she comes back. If, if in fact she does want to come back. So I feels like a win-win. All right. AEW had a rare, somewhat quiet dynamite this week. <laughs> I mean, in that, like, I mean, they still did a, a world title match and a cage match and, and a change. They changed the title and the Hardy boys debuted and all that. But by AEW standards, like only, only five things happened on dynamite this week instead of 5,000 things. And there were very few announcements of announcements and rampage airs immediately following the conclusion of the NCAA tournament, which means like 1230 Eastern (laughs) on Friday this week. So they're really not trying with the rampage card. So the big news coming out of AEW this week was Thunder Rosa finally winning that women's world title from Britt Baker. And they had a bonkers cage match where they did the title change in, uh, in Rosa's uh, hometown of San Antonio. So uh, there was that. Yeah, I think that's it's hard because you're going to compare it to the first match, which was probably more memorable. They did more sort of stunt <laughs> stuff in, in that one. Um, but you still had the blood and the thumbtacks and some crazy moves. And uh, unlike the last match, they had a full crowd and crowd was awesome on that show. And 
they played it up big. They gave Rosa a big entrance and the crowd went crazy when she won. And she seemed very legitimately emotional. And then Dustin Rhodes was out there for some reason. I didn't quite understand, but um, I guess, I guess he's, he's uh, like the women's trainer. Um, the, they're friends and they together are like the head coaches for the women's division there, which okay. is great if you know the story, but as usual, they told like 0% of the story and just assumed <laughs> that, you know, the story. Like I knew Dustin was a trainer, obviously, but yeah, I, I wouldn't, I was not aware that thunder was like co-head trainers with him. That's fine. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it seemed like a genuine nice moment and everything, but yeah, so it was, it was, a, it was a good moment. Uh, I did notice that Britt tweeted like the day before the show that she, I was something like I've never heard her mention San Antonio as her hometown before this week or something <laughs> like that. And then tweeted a gif of herself in Pittsburgh. I was like, ah, this is, this is good. This is what I want. Um, but yeah, uh, show up and down was, as you said, it was pretty fine. There was some good wrestling on the show. Opener six man was great and uh, set up another Adam Cole hangman match down the line. Probably set up Red Dragon versus uh, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. And then, uh, you know, elsewhere on the show, you said, yeah, they had the Hardys debut. And and they, in fact, probably most interestingly of all for for people, uh, they very as as (laughs) as is often the case with Young Bucks angles, uh, it was incredibly unsubtle as uh, Matt and Nick Jackson confronted bald FDR and hair FDR and uh, told them that they could go get another manager. They could go get the best there is, but they still would never be able to beat the Young Bucks. So we're finally getting that FTR Young Bucks rematch. And uh, certainly seems like they're alluding to bringing Bret Hart in. And then I think Dax, uh, I, I'm, I'm, it's a gimmick. I do actually know their names. Uh, Dax tweeted that uh, tweeted something directly about Bret today. So it seems like that's where we're heading. Yeah, uh, we talked a couple couple of points coming out more AEW stuff here to cover. We'll cover uh, if the person that just brought up the Brett stuff. We'll cover that first. Um, yeah, I can't imagine like Brett wanting to fly to TV every week and be mm-hmm. FTR's manager on a weekly basis. But as you pointed out uh, to me off the air, they have the Owen Hart tournaments coming up, and I'm not sure. Frankly, I would need a diagram to remember and have explained to me all the dynamic the dynamics of the heart family feuds and who is in fact speaking to one another in the heart family and who isn't but uh i don't think brett and martha have always been on the friendly of terms but hey by let's let bygones be bygones and now would be a good time to bring brett in occasionally as often as he wants to show up he could show up with ftr and ftr and the young bucks can have more good matches so that's good. And then something that we brought up that you brought up to me off the air, like having the Hardy's team this week. Um, like, yeah, I'm all for the Hardy boys getting back together. I mm-hmm. look as much crap as we've given Matt Hardy on the show <laughs> over the years. <laughs> <laughs> and as like horrible as it is every time I have to watch Matt Hardy's Twitch channel, which is like once every three weeks at this point, something happens that I have to watch Matt Hardy on Twitch and Man, I don't wish that on my worst enemies. Mm-hmm. But uh, the Hardy Boys getting back together is fine. And Jeff and Matt have been big stars for 25 years. And good for them for continuing to get paid and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, but once you've gotten the Hardy Boys back together, and once you've done the FTR match, and you've done the Young Bucks match, and you've done the Lich Brothers match, nostalgia has a shelf life. And I think everyone in AEW is wrestling smart enough to get that. Then what do you do with the Hardy Boys? Do you have enough nostalgia matches or enough novelty matches to get your money's worth and to get a run out of the Hardys? Like, what do you do after you do the four dream matches or whatever? Yeah, I this. Yeah, this is a good question (laughs) that we (laughs) we discussed off the air, as you said. Um I mean, you can do the the one final race for the tag titles or whatever and have them 
you know, wrestle a bunch of teams to rise up through the rankings and, and get the tag title shot. And then they finally win them or whatever. Um, you could, that's one, that's something that you could, you could probably sp- space out over a couple of months, even in a way to get them to have wrestling matches that matter, even if they aren't against teams that people are like super jazzed about seeing them wrestle. And then beyond that, unfortunately for Matt, as is often the case, I probably would then think about what can we get out of Jeff as a singles uh, from there? Because I I don't know if there's like, I think you could do like a one pay-per-view cycle, Jeff Hardy world title push either. I'm not necessarily that you would put the belt on him, but you could build him up for a main event match, possibly with CM Punk, for example. I mean, you have, there's people in this company, MJF would be another one. Like, I think there's feuds for Jeff as a singles. Obviously, a, you know, a, a hero versus new kid, him versus Darby, it would be something. Like, I feel like there's there's a, a little bit of stuff for the Hardys to do, as you've laid out the, the three or four dream matches, maybe a, a tag title run. Um, and then I feel like you have to look at Okay, for the rest of the time we have, and again, this is assuming he stays healthy and sober, uh, I think then you kind of have to go, okay, thank you for your service, Matt. Uh, now we're going to, we got to look at what we can get out of Jeff as a singles. <laughs> well, they have just had like three years of Matt or two years of Matt uh, without Jeff. So it's like they've already, you know, Matt is already like half transitioned into the, uh, you know, uh, coach, like half coach manager mm. role anyway. So like as long as Matt stays on the straight and narrow also, I think uh, mm-hmm. there's, there's there's roles for him off off screen also. So. For sure. Yeah. Anywho, that is uh, that is a W. They are not really uh, I'm not really sure what they're building towards right now. Like they, they haven't announced. Do they have a, a battle of the belts again sometime soon? I think so. Like maybe at the beginning of May or something, but okay. like we're still four weeks away from that. And anyway, they have, they're not really, they don't really have a destination right now. So that's, uh, that's always troubling. <laughs> I was going to say this. I saw someone tweet like, when's the last time there was a dynamite where there was just no CM Punk presence whatsoever? I don't know, but there's been one. <laughs> <laughs> Understandably so, right? Like, like since he's, yeah, he signed. So, I mean, last week he wasn't on the show, but they did do like a video package for the dog collar match and have like post match comments from him. So, you got to get him. I don't know if he's going to be off for like a couple of weeks or if he'll be back next week and they plug him into his next feud or what, what's going on in there. But it's like you got to get something with punk started. I don't know who the next, like, they're, they're teasing some stuff with wheeler yuda leaving leaving the best friends and going to join uh william regal and his idiot sons uh so you got i guess eventually you'll you'll pick a team to go against uh danielson and moxley so there's like a bunch of people that are like established (laughs) they're establishing plenty of acts they have jericho's new crew which is him and daniel garcia and a tag team out of 1980s memphis and Jay Kager. Um, and uh, so, like, there's a bunch of acts that feel which legitimate. And you got the Wardlow MJF stuff kicking off this week. So, like, you got stuff going on, but none of it feels like, okay, we're really ramping up for like either that Battle of the Belt show or even just like a big dynamite show because they don't really build for that end of May pay per view until like three weeks out, as we well know. So, yeah, it doesn't feel like there's a ton going on other than just kind of some week to week stuff. Yeah, and the uh, the New Japan Cup is happening, and uh, neither of us are watching it. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's it, going it's on. A heard... mo- it's a month long singles tournament with forty eight dudes in it. Like, who could who could possibly care? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to. Uh... I bet the finals will be good. Maybe I'll maybe we'll tune in by that point. <laughs> sure. I I saw that Naito beat Tanahashi, and it's like, well, it's not what I would have done. <laughs> One of the both guys are physically done. 
one still has great matches, even though he's physically done. Mm -hmm. The other does not. And they put the wrong guy over. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. My only other note about that is speaking of Tanahashi, he did a nice tribute to Scott Hall. And I didn't know the story until this week that Scott Hall just randomly decided on a new Japan show in 2001, that he was going to lose to a young boy. Uh, on a on a new japan show that was hiroshi tanahashi and then after he lost to him he went around telling everybody who would listen that that kid's gonna be an effing star and so it's like hey good instinct scott yeah yeah it turns out he was smart about wrestling Mm -hmm. yeah i'd never heard that story either yeah but uh the rookies never win in new japan Mm -hmm. and and uh, yeah scott hall put over tanahashi in like 2001 (laughs) it's pretty incredible yeah Again, speaking of the complicated legacy of Scott Hall, which is like, you know, he had a, uh, he didn't have a good reputation as far as working with the younger generation until he did Mm -hmm. years later. (laughs) And, but I think he was professionally uh, fairly well liked. And most of the heat for being politicians and stuff went on the other members of the clique and the other members of the NWO. And he may have been a, a he had a bad personal reputation, but, uh, you know, nobody really talked a bunch of crap about Scott Hall as a professional wrestler. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Anything else you want to talk about? No, I think we, uh, we bookended it quite, quite nicely with, with Scott Hall talk uh, as, as nicely as it can be when talking about someone dying, I suppose. But, yeah, a lot, lot going on, and we're we're just stuck on Cody Watch for <laughs> from now until he shows his stupid neck tattoo somewhere on somebody's television show. If he's gonna show up, it's got to be in Chicago, right? <laughs> Second best place where to show we? Up? Deja vu. Where have I heard this before? <laughs> I've heard a lot of credible intelligence that he's going to be in Chicago this week for well, Raw. Of course, of course, Sister Roberta. Uh, yeah, I don't, I like, yeah, you would think, or if he's not on this show, then he's coming out at mania. If he doesn't come out at mania, he's the night after. If he's not on the night after, I don't know. (laughs) He might be dead. There's, there's people who are like, oh, I heard he's not going. And it's like, okay, look, I know wrestlers can be really dumb and we have a, a lot of evidence. Like Cody has a giant neck tattoo. Cody wants to be Dwayne Johnson, but he has a giant red, white, and blue cartoon neck tattoo of a transformer with wings on it. <laughs> it's like we have a lot of evidence that maybe Cody is not the smartest guy. Mm-hmm. However, if there were two wrestling companies that could pay me millions of dollars, I I don't think I would orchestrate a scenario where I would <laughs> ensure <laughs> that one company was not going to pay me millions of dollars unless I was very certain that the other company was going to. Pay. I would not engineer a scenario where neither company that could pay me millions of dollars to be a professional wrestler would be willing to pay me millions of dollars to be a professional wrestler. You'd have to be really dumb to work yourself into that situation. Sure would. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fun little layer to this. All right. Until next time, everybody, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We will be back soon with more stories from the rest of the Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Like the report was now on Kevin Nash comes first. <laughs> How many times do you think he said that in his life? <laughs> oh, dozens, dozens at least. He's the greatest. He's in that new Channing Tatum movie with the dog. <laughs> They're old buddies now, right? Because he did the magic mics with uh, with Tatum. Yeah. yeah. I love I love Big Kev's Big Kev's second act as a <laughs> mostly silent background movie character.
<laughs> as a character actor yeah it's great i am uh, not drinking coke <laughs> energy today i'm drinking a canned um uh, latte but mm. arguably i've had more coke energy since it was discontinued <laughs> than i had before <laughs> before it was discontinued so there's that well there we are here <laughs> Look, you're only one man, but no one, in, I would say, in this country, including, like, whoever originally greenlit the product in the upper echelons of Coca-Cola have done more for the Coke Energy brand than you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting my flowers now. Right. <laughs> Big believer in that. Um, have you tried a Coke Starlight? I know you mostly drink water, but no, I have not. Is that a what's what's the gimmick there? It's a cola, limited edition cola that tastes like outer space. <laughs> <laughs> That's their marketing tagline, not mine. Okay, so it's My... like Jupiter flavored. <laughs> Yeah, something like that. My review is uh, vaguely tastes like burnt cotton candy. <laughs> it's wow. not bad though. I I'm, uh-huh. <laughs> I prefer I prefer it in the can. You know, wait, mm-hmm. what? But uh, <laughs> yeah, it tastes better. It tastes better coming out of the can. Oh, um, I don't know. If that's any better? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's not bad. It's like cola mixed with cotton candy. It's it's okay, and it's available for a limited time only. So there okay. you go. Well, there you are. That's, uh... that's this week's Coca Cola <laughs> products and services update. That's, that's right. The worst, the absolute worst. So if 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 uh, if Troy and Joe are going to Espen, yeah. Uh, how does Fox? deal with that because like who do they got that can be like and not 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 like i think any of the fox teams are bad but they're not they don't got a superstar team now like are they do they try to lure like i know al michaels has been like maybe on the move do they try to go go after him or somebody like what do they what does fox do now that they lost their their a couple that's that it's, it is a couple. Um, <laughs> that's without question. They're very much in love, and they have been for for decades now. But uh, yeah, I think they are inclined to promote Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olson. Okay, everyone's very high on Greg Olson, and uh, I think he's very good. And Kevin Burkhart is very good, and they've been using him as like the studio guy for baseball for years and years. And uh, like there are worse ideas than just promoting those guys from within. Mm-hmm. They have Adam Amin. They have they have a lot of good candidates who are all younger than seventy seven year old Al Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> but like Al Michaels is going to be out there. Um, yeah, so I still think Al Michaels ends up at uh, Amazon call Thursday nights with Kirk Herb Street. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think that Al, yeah, that's the only guy I could see, uh, uh, Fox getting other than, uh, just prom- promoting their own teams from within. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Yeah. My other thought was like, is there, you could promote, uh, Kevin maybe, yeah. but do you go find like a bigger, like f- superstar former player? I don't know who there is though, unless you can get. Tom, I mean, Tom Brady went back to playing football. Right. Um, there was talk- Peyton or Peyton in full time, although he's there, got an ESPN deal, right? Yeah, they're with ESPN through 24. Um, the question would be okay, would you try to trade for, apparently, you know, would you trade for Drew Brees or try to get Drew Brees out of his NBC contract? You mm-hmm. think NBC has buyers remorse on Drew Brees after, <laughs> after seeing his performances this, this past year? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that guy's out there though. So I think, and let right and let, like I can't yeah. think of anybody who's who's out there that I mean, Philip Rivers, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> right? It would have to yeah. be like somebody like that. Uh, 
trying to think of what other. So, uh, Andy Dalton, is he still playing? <laughs> He's still backing uh, up somewhere. Yeah, he was. Uh, he backed up uh, for the Bears this year. I That's don't right. think he officially retired. Not that that um, would be like a superstar of no. a greater value than like just keeping Greg Olson, but no, but like a starting quote, you know, a player that is nationally known was like a starting quarterback. It's mm-hmm. usually a pretty good call. Well, hey, Baker wants out of the Browns now, so that's beautiful. You know what? I became a, a much bigger. I was already kind of a Baker Mayfield fan just mm. because I think he's excellent at commercials. <laughs> but he's he's not Peyton Manning good because, frankly, no one has ever been Peyton Manning good. Correct. <laughs> but he's very good at commercials uh, and has taken like C minus material in those progressive commercials and made it like <laughs> A minus material. He's that good at commercials. But anyway, I became a much bigger fan of him today when he. Uh, reached a level of pettiness that very few of us in life will ever get the opportunity <laughs> to uh, exercise. Uh, yeah. When uh, he waited until his, the t- his team was no longer in the running for a better quarterback and then announced that he would like to be traded. <laughs> it's great. I mean, <laughs> well, especially if like the Browns, I mean, I, I, I mean, I assume he was aware they were trying to get him, but it is very funny that he like played coy about it until mm-hmm. it was like declared that they were no longer in the running too. Yeah, well, his apparently the Browns met with his people like a month ago or two weeks ago and said, "Look, we're only going to try to replace Baker as the quarterback if a top flight quarter like an elite guy becomes available." Mm-hmm. <laughs> He has one year left on his contract there in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so then uh, he tweeted yesterday when or whenever it came out that the Browns were interested in Deshaun Watson. He tweeted like, oh, you know, Cleveland is always going to be a big part of my story. I don't know what happens next. My my wife and I love Cleveland and, you know, we appreciate everything you did for us. The city did for us here and uh, Mm -hmm. we'll see what happens down the road. So it wasn't like a total shock today that he okay. announced like I want to be traded, but it, he did in fact wait until <laughs> his team was out of the running for a better quarterback to announce that he wanted to be traded. That's pretty great. That's pretty good. Yeah. The Ravens are doing a thing that I've never seen them do before, which is spend a lot of money in free agency. <laughs> I don't know how to. I don't know how to feel about this. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, in theory, it's better than doing nothing, which has been, <laughs> which has been mostly the strategy to re-sign yeah. players that are here and are probably already past their prime to larger deals. Yeah. Um, it's a strategy, you know? <laughs> the Two of the like four guys that they brought in are guys that used to play here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, wow, yeah. So it's like it would have been better if we just would have signed them, you know, to second contracts, but mm-hmm. we usually don't do it. So it's like, I don't know. It's that thing though of like uh the I always talk about where they like veteran guys. The coaching staff likes veteran guys because they're smart football players. The problem with like 30 and 31 year old football players is that's like the age where you start getting hurt all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we just spent like, you know, a combined $200 million on a bunch of 30 year old football players. So it's hmm. the safety out of all those, those four guys they signed, the safety is like 25. So that's like, I think the, the, the probably the best deal out of all mm-hmm. those, but. There you go. Yeah, it's one of those things where if if you look at the problems that, <laughs> that faced the Ravens last year, oh, uh, I mean, both sides of the ball were were beat up, but like that defense, just how many plays were like our starting <laughs> defense on the field together? <laughs> we're all eleven guys, like who we meant to have out there as starters, it had to be zero. Yeah, so you know, we'll see. We're we're rolling the dice, but. <laughs> All right, we talked an awful lot here. <laughs> I have to watch Impact Wrestling again tonight. Not happy about that at all. Condolences. 
I try to keep on keeping on.